Good morning, everybody. Glad to have you here at Hillside this morning. Please stand with us as we begin worshiping by singing together.
Good morning again. For our call to worship this morning, we'll be reading Psalm 15. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor, and casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will not be shaken. Please continue worshiping with us. With heaven-spun creations, his pride and adoration, treasures woven by his love. His careful hands, they hold us safe within his promise of calling and of destiny. And I will sing of all you've done And I'll remember how far you've carried me From beginning until the end You are faithful, faithful to the end A Father's heart that's for me A never-ending story Of love that's always chasing me His kindness overwhelming Hope for me unending He's never given up on me you weren't by my side there wasn't a day that you let me fall in all of my life your love has been true with all of my life I will worship you there wasn't a day that you weren't by my side there wasn't a day that you let me fall in all of my life. Your love has been true with all of my life. I will worship you and I will sing of all you've done and I'll remember Faithful, faithful to the end Until the end Until the end I'm begging 
begging please again I need you Oh I need you Walking down these desert roads Water for my thirsty soul I need you Oh I need you Your forgiveness Is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears It's like holy water on my Walking, saved to sin. I want to know about being born again. I need you, God. I need you to take me to the riverside, take me under baptized. I need you, God. I need you. Your forgiveness is like sweet. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears It's like holy water on my skin I don't want to abuse your grace God, I need it every day it's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change I don't want to abuse your grace God, I need it every day It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change I don't want to abuse your grace God, I need it every day It's the only thing that ever really I don't want to abuse your grace God, I need it every day It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears it's like holy water, your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy. like holy water that was great thank you worship band children if you haven't guessed it's time for you to go out to your classes And I have a few announcements for you. Uh, the first, I'll get it out of the way, is just the offering, the various ways to make your gift of worship through offering at this church. One is through a uh, basket in the middle of the sanctuary. The other, another one in person is um, with the debit machine in the foyer. And then we also have a lot of options for online giving, so you could check that out if, if you prefer. Um, we have a church picnic coming up at the end of June. Uh, register for that through the website. We are uh, purchasing the food. It's a barbecue type of picnic, and we need to know how many people are coming. If you're able to donate uh, for the cost of your own 
meal, that would be great uh, if you can't um, afford it. If it's, I know things are tight for a lot of people these days. If you can't afford it, then um, we have others who are donating on your behalf. So please don't come because you feel that you can't afford it. Um, and the suggested donation is $5. So, um, yeah, the, I know Kristen and team are planning a lot of fun stuff for us that day. So what we can pray for is good weather. Uh, we still are looking for tech helpers in the church. So if you would like to offer to help with either the live streaming of the service, the camera work, the soundboard, or the putting up of the slide words, join the tech team. That's pretty clear, right? Join the tech team. That would be very much appreciated. And uh, yeah, there are a team of people who take turns. You're not on every single week. So you can book yourself off when you are not available. Um, and you can offer yourself up when you are. So that would be great. Um, and there is a deep dive tomorrow night. And a deep, the deep dive is actually just a Zoom conversation that, uh, it, that happens that is a follow-up to what uh, is preached today. So uh, tomorrow evening, I believe it's 7 p.m., uh, the Zoom link is, is that on the website? If you need the Zoom link, check with one of, any one of us afterwards and we can get it to you. Um, and it's for an hour. So that group of people meets and speak and talks and prays together. Uh, I still want to mention that we haven't had a donation of a working lawnmower yet. Um, I think that very shortly we will be, is that slide up there? No, it's not. Let's not worry about it. <laughs> we had a conversation about a dead or alive lawnmower last week. Um, it, I think we'll be purchasing one this week. And uh, so I, we're also, because we're a Creation Care kind of church, we're going to get a push mower. So, um, yeah, if, if we don't get one donated. Um, what else do I want to say? I have lots of announcements, right? Uh, we had an, a memorial service here yesterday for Edna Cron, a uh, very beautiful service. Um, Edna is um, mom of Sherry and Curtis, who attend here with their families, and uh, it was a beautiful service. The flowers are from that service, so in memory of Edna today. And, of course, there was a happy occasion this past week. Uh, Donna turned 80. She doesn't want me to say that. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Donna. And we have um, uh, an opportunity for you to sign a greeting for Donna in the foyer after the service that uh, Joanne is putting together for her. So we would love to send you our best wishes, Donna. You're a blessing among us and have been for a lot of years. So the last thing I want to just briefly talk about is prayer. Um, I shouldn't just br briefly talk about prayer, but at this moment, that's what I'm going to do. There's a lot of opportunities uh, for you to uh, receive prayer in this church. So after the service, um, any one of the pastors um, or the prayer team, you could approach and um, ask for prayer for anything specific that you are, would like prayer for. Um, during the week, I want to say that the staff is also available. If you phoned and asked for me or Jeff or Nate or Kristen and asked us if, we, if you could pray with us, I know we would be delighted to meet you and do that as well. Um, we also have this prayer book that is in the foyer on the desk out there, and if you want to just anonymously write down a prayer request, then feel free to do that as well. So we... We want to be a church of prayer. Prayer is where God begins to work in our lives. So we need to be praying together at every opportunity. And we will be doing that in a minute as Jeff comes up uh, for the commissioning of the Reach Out to Africa team. Thanks, Pauline. Good morning. My name is Jeff. I'm one of the co-pastors here at Hillside. And I'd like to invite the summer team uh, from Reach Out to Africa to come forward. They leave this Thursday, the 16th, for South Africa. If you're uh, not aware, for over 15 years, Hillside has supported the mission work of Reach Out to Africa, which is dedicated to making significant changes in the lives of children, youth, and young adults in the Impumang in Pumalanga province of South Africa and beyond. 
And each summer they host uh, hope camps, which demonstrate their conviction that every child is important and deserves the love and care of an adult and the chance to hear and experience the gospel of grace. And today, as I understand it, is packing day, right? Today is packing day. And the team includes Dan and Tannis Mitchell, as well as Selena Kropp. And I know that Amy Richardson's on her way, and so we'll bring her up at the end before the benediction. Just so. She's on her way. And that's Amy's grandmother, who just let us know that. Um, but she is on the way. Uh, Dan is a team leader, and I saw also on your latest update that all of the children, all 80 children, have been fully paid for for a hope camps. It is really, really good news. And so we will praise God for that uh, in a moment. I do want to ask if you, um, since we do have a little bit of time, just to, to say what is one thing that you are hoping for this summer? All of you don't have to answer, and if you want to think about it, you can say it at the end of the service. But what's the thing that you're hoping for, for yourself or for Hope Camps? Um, then, then, we'll, then I'll pray for you. Shoot. One thing? Just one. Can I extend it beyond the summer? <laughs> if I could just push the boundary there a little bit. Um, please pray for, oh yes, good, that came up. Um, that's Sister, some of you know Sister, tremendous example of what we are hoping for. And uh, if you could please pray that the property of Ecucanieni, which is 200 plus acres, will help facilitate the give job opportunities and so on to, to carry on the growth, not just from childhood, but into youth and adulthood, because there's a tremendous potential on that property. We just need the business and, yeah, to make it a job opportunity for lots of people. Hi. I'd like to ask for prayer that um, every one of the kids would feel loved and cared for at the camp, and just for safety for our team for good health um i just had surgery to remove a spot on thursday and that everything would heal okay and um yeah we appreciate your prayers <laughs> i sprung that on you so no worries no worries i'm so glad that you are able to be here and up front let's pray for you and we'll pray for all of us as a congregation let's pray Gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you for your indescribable gift to us of sending Jesus Christ, your only Son, to make a way for each one of us, to make a way back to you, and to make a way through the walls that we build between one another. And we praise you for the generosity of many people who've made this trip possible and you have made it possible for these 80 kids to attend uh, the Hope Camps this summer. We thank you for Sister and her, um, her life and her witness to uh, the power that these Hope Camps have in the lives of these children. So pray with what Dan just shared, that more and more children would follow in her footsteps, receive your grace, and make a difference in the lives uh, of her community. We pray for the, this time uh, for this team in South Africa that, to be a time of joy and peace among their own team, um, but especially in the hearts of those attending Hope Camp, and that this would result in thanksgiving and more praise to your name, O oh God. We thank you for the, this team, for Dan and Tannis, for Selena and for Amy, that you would keep them safe on their long journey to South Africa this week. We pray you would continue to supply everything that they need. And we pray that you would surprise them from the riches of your grace with moments of joy and laughter and beauty throughout this summer. Open their eyes and their hearts to what you are doing in the world and in their lives and equip them each day with the right word and the loving deed most needed. May they be stronger to, together and sensitive to your spirit and overflowing with hope. And we pray for each one of us here in the congregation as we travel and go about our lives uh, this summer, that you would open our eyes and our hearts to what you are doing in the world. Keep us sensitive to your spirit 
Keep our conversations seasoned with grace, and may we be a people witnessing to your good hope for the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Please stand and join us as we continue in singing. All these pieces broken and scattered in mercy gathered and mended and whole empty handed but not forsaken I've been set free I've been set free oh amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me oh i once was lost but now am found was blind but now i see oh i can see the love in your eyes laying yourself down raising up the broken to life you take our failures you take our Set your treasure in jars of clay. So take this heart, Lord, I'll be your vessel, the world to see your life in me. Oh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved us like me oh, oh, oh I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see oh I can see you now oh, I can see the love in your eyes laying yourself Thank you, Nate and Naomi and Kristen and Vince for leading us into worship this morning, and I'll add my good morning to you as we continue in worship. My name is Carrie Schuliger, and I am a member of the preaching team here at Hillside, and I look forward to listening to God with you this morning as we open this text together. Pray with me. Dear Jesus, this is a good morning because you are with us, and you love us. We ask for the grace to trust in your presence and to believe in your love as we reflect on this, your living word. Amen. The titles of my sermons always shift throughout my writing process, so this sermon title shifted from the pain of unrequited love to the foolishness of love. The pain of unrequited love to the foolishness of love. In some ways, these two titles are getting at the same thing. 
God's unrequited love for the Corinthians through Paul is foolishness. And it begs the question, how could that foolishness possibly be good news? You hear a lot about our love story from my husband, Jeff. So I'm going to give you a snapshot of the beginnings of our love story from my vantage point. (laughs) Jeff fell in love with me when I was actually at my worst. I was well on my way down the dark path of depression, felt like a failure, and was just going through the motions of life. I couldn't fathom anyone being attracted to me. So I rebuffed his attention. My rejection of Jeff had a great deal to do with me and my inability to see the gift that was in front of me. Yet Jeff foolishly kept pursuing me. And he went to the nth degree in both directions to show his affection. From awkward humility to cringy boasting. So you're going to need the details, right? One time, he literally lowered himself all the way down to cleaning my dorm room rug with his bare hands to surprise me. Cringy humility. Another time, he showed up at my dorm room to show off in his full dress blue military uniform. Awkward. (laughs) This wide range of love was met with my uh, thank you, but no thank you, I'm still looking around. So Jeff may have looked like a fool, but I was the fool for turning away this smart, generous man who would go to any lengths, love me at my worst, and let me know of his love. Now that's that's obviously not where the story ends, but that's where it began. So in our text today, the Corinthians are at the beginning of their courtship with God, who will go and has gone to the nth degree to show his love. And they're being foolish. They're looking around at more attractive gospels. They're turning away, rebuffing his love. So Paul in this passage reflects the lengths to which God will go, from humility to the heights, for the sake of winning them back to God. Listen or follow along as I read the passage today. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 16 through 12, 10. And it's going to sound a little foolish and crazy, but this is love, so pay attention to that. Paul writes, I repeat, let no one take me for a fool, but if you do, then tolerate me just as you would a fool, so that I may do a little boasting. In this self-confident boasting, I am not talking as the Lord would, but as a fool. Since many are boasting in the way the world does, I too will boast. You gladly put up with fools, since you are so wise. In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you or exploits you or takes advantage of you or puts on airs or slaps you in the face. To my shame, I admit, we were too weak for that. Whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and have been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. 
Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is to be praised forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under King Aritas had the city of the Damascenes guarded in order to arrest me. But I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through his hands. Chapter 12. I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up into the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think me think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of the things, these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. According to Wikipedia, unrequited love, or one-sided love, is love that is not openly reciprocated or understood as such by the beloved. Unrequited love is affection that is not returned or understood by the beloved. Paul is experiencing the pain of unrequited love from this newly formed church in Corinth. And this part of the letter reveals the desperate attempt to explain and demonstrate the depth of his love for the sake of their relationship with Christ. Paul, in essence, has already lowered himself to the level of cleaning their dorm room carpet with his bare hands. So in our passage today, he is even willing to go against his better judgment and pull out his dress blues to show off. Paul really loves this church. His love for this church makes him rather weak-kneed, so much so that he's willing to be considered a fool. According to history, the people of Corinth are the nouveau riche. They were former slaves who have slowly climbed the rungs of the economic and social ladder, and the gospel comes to them through Paul. The gospel was received, but this community did not want to look to the lower rungs of the ladder from which they had just climbed for their teaching. As Kristen explained last week, Paul supported his ministry by doing a lower-class trade, making leather tents, and he refused to be paid for his speaking engagements, which was confusing and off-putting to the Corinthians. They weren't interested in looking down the ladder for their teaching, so they turned their heads up the ladder to the eloquent speakers, who Paul sarcastically names the super-apostles. They were captivated by the easy false gospels of these slick preachers. And the teachings of these super apostles were not benign. The smooth tongued false messages were like the siren calls of the mermaids of old that would cause wreckage and death. Their teachings were enslaving and, in, and exploiting the people. This must have been both heartbreaking and infuriating for Paul. So because of intense love, Paul lowers himself to boasting, knowing that he could be seen as an insecure fool showing off to get their attention. Paul knows it's in bad taste to boast, but he will even go to these lengths, laying down his best practices, risking appearing like a prideful braggart for this fickle but beloved church. 
So it's a little cringy and awkward in this part of the letter. But he gives up even what he believes is the best way and says, in essence, I shouldn't boast because boasting is foolish. God knows how little my suffering has been and how small my accolades are compared to Christ. But, well, okay, because I am weak because of my love for you, I'll even boast. I don't think he's thinking he's writing a manual for church planting here. If he was to do that, this method would be buried in the addendum at the back of the book. It might be titled something like, Boasting, the last resort for a wayward church. And as a little free relational advice, boasting or showing up in your dress blues should be kept for the very last resort. (laughs) Back to Paul. The truth about Paul is that he has suffered terribly and terrifyingly to preach the good news over the course of his life. I think I would have given up after a night adrift at sea. The ocean at night terrifies me, let alone receiving 39 lashes from my own people, the Jewish leaders. But for Paul, love, extraordinary, relentless, Christ-like, some would say crazy love, keeps him going to the nth degree. But the Corinthians can't see that his suffering is on their behalf. In fact, they're kind of repulsed by his humility. So he pulls out his CV and tells the truth of his sufferings to get the good news of of God's love to as many as his days will allow. Then he goes on to speak of the unspeakable revelations and visions that have been graces to him, even though he's pretty sure this boasting will do no good. Christ's love through Paul's life appears so foolish. It's relentless. It's cringeworthy. It's vulnerable. It's undeservedly generous. The quality of love doesn't make sense. From the other more impressive leaders, They want to follow the suave influencers who will exploit and even mock them, slap them in the face for their foolishness. I'm sure I would say, don't waste your time. Let them go, Paul. Move on. But praise Jesus, God's love doesn't follow that kind of reason. Love persists. Love suffers. Love is foolish. Love in the kingdom of God appears utterly foolish. What father would give half of his estate to a wanderlust son with no strings attached? What shepherd would leave 99 perfectly good sheep to go after one? What king would send his son to live among and be killed by commoners? God's love is so far beyond words, he had to show us with actions in the persons of Jesus. A king who loves to the degree of foolish, undeserved extravagance and makes a way for the killers to be forgiven and live in his kingdom forever is so so astounding that words cannot express. Paul gets this, and he's carrying out his mission that Christ himself gave him on the road to Damascus. The account in Acts 26 is worth revisiting. Listen to the words that Jesus says to Paul. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Even Jesus' words to Paul indicate that this side of eternity, the good news is going to feel good and bad. It's very good to be the recipient of this astounding grace, and if you are still saying, thanks but no thanks to God's love, I would encourage you to give it another look. Jesus is true love coming at you, and I'd be happy to talk about about that with you after the service. If you have received the astounding gift of God's love, then we just don't wait around for the fulfillment of the kingdom. In love, Christ invites us to follow him in that recklessly foolish and wildly vulnerable way of love. No joke. If we are following Jesus as Paul is doing, we will risk everything, from shipwrecks to even cringy boasting, because it's worth everything 
that others can know this astoundingly generous and generative love in this relationship with Jesus. Paul knows the gift of the experience of the love of God. Fueled by a glimpse of the eternal, it's what Paul is talking about. It's Paul he's talking about, by the way, in the third heaven. He keeps loving all those to whom he sent. He doesn't describe his visions of heaven, but it's so significant that he's given a thorn, bless you, in the flesh to keep him from being conceited about it. I mean it when I say bless you. He does everything in the weakness and foolishness of love for even the remote possibility that the Corinthian church will return to God's love. It's worth it. In his letter, Paul also speaks of the thorn in his flesh after getting a glimpse of what I will call eternal love. We can only imagine what he saw or heard in this revelation or vision, but it was powerful enough that God deemed it necessary for that experience to be tempered in some way, and Paul compares this tempering to a thorn in his flesh. This thorn kept him humble, kept him from exploding in pride for seeing the things that are so astounding that there are no words. So what are we to make of this thorn in Paul's flesh? Much has been written on this topic, and many use and misuse this metaphor in the Christian faith. I believe there is intentionality in the omission of the specificity here. What Paul does communicate here is that there is some level of intense suffering that is related to what he has seen of God and his kingdom in order that he remain free of conceit. It may have been a painful or debilitating eye condition based on some references with his correspondence with the Galatians. It may have been an ongoing spiritual attack. It may have been the hardship of being alone or being seen as a fool. It remains veiled, but as I've studied, thought, and prayed about this this week, I've wondered if the thorn for Paul, like the thorns in Christ's brow, represent the deep pain in one-sided love. It is possible that Paul experienced chronic pain in knowing that some were missing out on this deep love of God, the saving love that he experienced on the road to Damascus, and the glorious love that he glimpsed in his, vin- in his visions. It is excruciating when love is not received or understood by the beloved. Again, as Christian, Kristen said last week, this second letter to the Corinthian church is Paul's desperation. It's his heartfelt plea for them to return to the love of God. The thorns pressed into Christ's forehead shout mocking rejection. Like the Corinthians, the people who demanded Jesus' crucifixion wanted power, not weakness. They wanted a king, not a homeless carpenter. Yet it is this vulnerable God who loves us best in his weakest moment. His death, a foolish end to the leader of new movement, is the way of love. You know this already, but this is what love looks like. This is the way. A slain lamb opening the way to unspeakable glory. This is the truth. The Almighty God becomes all vulnerable for love. First of all, first and foremost, do you know this love? Do you know this love? Take another look at the cross. And may you have the grace sufficient to see your belovedness and respond to that love in kind. Secondly, if you know this love, if you've experienced the love of Jesus, do you love like this? Take another look at the cross. In his book, Crazy Love, Francis Chan writes, God's definition of what matters is pretty straightforward. He measures our lives by how we love. He goes on to say, something is wrong when our lives make sense to unbelievers. If this is too hard, if you feel too weak to love others to the nth degree, or if the thorn in your flesh is too much to bear, remember the the words that Jesus spoke to Paul that kept him in the game. Jesus said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. 
If what you are facing is too hard, Jesus says to you, my grace is sufficient. If you feel too weak to carry on, Jesus says to you, my grace is sufficient. If the thorn in your flesh is too much for you to bear, Jesus suffers with you and says to you, my grace is sufficient. This is good news. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for your vulnerable, relentless love. Give us the grace to first humbly receive your love and then another wave of grace to love like you do. Amen. Please stand with us as we respond to God's word in singing. like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy when all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me oh how he loves us oh oh how he loves us how he loves us
what you're thinking. Jeff's going to say something in response to her sharing. <laughs> no, that's not it. But I do want to invite the South African team up for uh, the front just so you get to see. I know Amy had an earlier appointment, but she made it. So Amy is here and Selena and Dan and Tanis. And I want to invite you just to, to, to bless them as, uh, as after the benediction. Just feel free to come up. If you do have a question, feel free to ask them. But bless them as they pack today and leave on Thursday. And now receive the benediction. The good news is that God's love is relentless, even if it's not reciprocated. He loves you with crazy love. So despite the thorns, by God's all-sufficient grace, let's be fools in love, loving others all the way home. Go in love. <laughs>